Cool. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Canberra AWS User Group for May 2020. My name is Brian Farnhill. I'm a developer specialist at Amazon Web Services. And uh, tonight, we're going to go through a uh, the usual run-through of news at the, the start to tell you what's been happening in the world of AWS. Um, we'll talk about some online training and some white paper updates that have been coming out. And then we'll get on to the main presentation, which is going to be Craig Lawton talking about uh, the, the edge to cloud continuum, and the IoT being all about software. So starting off with what's new in AWS this month, uh, we've had 148 features and updates uh, been released so far, still a few days left in the month. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that plays out over the next little bit. And uh, for those interested in tracking the chart, because we do that every month, that's what uh, that's what it looks like so far. So we're uh, we've been ramping up after we took a break from reInvent last year. My uh, my top ten that I wanted to talk to you about this month in terms of what's new and, and what's been coming out. Firstly, AWS Systems Manager now has an Explorer view that gives you a multi-account summary of your trusted advisor checks. Now, what this means is, so Trusted Advisor has a number of different checks that validate your account against uh, some best practices around cost management, performance, security, and a bunch of different areas. Previously, aggregating that across many different AWS accounts required a, a custom solution of some sort to be able to bring it to one place. Now, Systems Manager has the ability to aggregate this data for you. The, uh, the next one I wanted to talk about, as I realized I should have changed the view, um, is that Amazon Elasticsearch UltraWarm is now generally available. So UltraWarm was a storage tier for Elasticsearch that got announced at reInvent last year and has been in preview since then. Basically, we heard feedback from customers that said the, the cost of Elasticsearch for long-term log retention was not necessarily feasible, but we still wanted to have the flexibility to search and, and work with that log data. So now with the ultra warm tier, you can keep the most recent logs in that hot storage tier and then pay less for your long-term log archival while still having the ability to use Elasticsearch. So this is a really great outcome and it's now generally available wherever Elasticsearch is running. It gets me every time when I swap the view and I, that was Craig. Cool. Um, I'm going to have a month without a tech glitch one month, I swear. All right. Uh, the next one, Amazon Kendra is generally available. So Kendra, again, was announced at reInvent last year. And this was uh, AWS's take on reinventing the enterprise search. So Kendra has the ability to index content from like your intranets and, and so sort of corporate document sources and provide a natural language search ability over them so that you can ask intelligent questions like, how do I reset my network password? And Kendra can find the appropriate content from your documents and try to present the users with the answer that they're looking for, as opposed to just it's on this page somewhere or it's in this document somewhere. So it's been in preview for a little while now and uh, has gone generally available. Actually, there's a few things that have gone GA this month, so Kendra being the, the second one. Next, RDS for SQL Server now has support for SQL Server reporting services. There was actually a few updates for SQL, Microsoft SQL Server in RDS this month. Um, so reporting services is there, integration services is there, distributed transaction support is there. Uh, so this was just one headline out of all of those. So basically, if you're a customer that's been looking to leverage things, like particularly reporting services for doing your dashboards and, and reports, but you didn't want to have to run a separate reporting server to be able to leverage RDS. Now you can do it all in the one managed solution. Next on my list, Amazon Fraud Detector. Uh, this one's still in preview, but the update for this month is that it's now available in additional regions, being Ohio, Ireland, Singapore, and good old Sydney. So Fraud Detector is a really great way to build the ability to detect fraud, funnily enough, into your applications without you having to build your own custom machine learning model to do it. Uh, you provide the data of you know, normal transactions and fraudulent transactions, and Fraud Detector will do the rest of it for you to help pick out those fraudulent transactions. Next, AWS Code Build test reporting is now generally available. So one of the things as a, as a developer that I'd come across using Code Build was that if my unit tests were failing, finding the results and which test failed meant scrolling through a lot of different logs. Now, 
what we've got with the test reporting is the ability to upload JUnit format results. So it's just an XML file into code build and have it visualize those results for me. So it makes it really easy to see how long the tests ran for, which ones passed and which ones failed. So this is a really great mechanism for developers who are running tests inside of code build. All right, next up, another systems manager update, a multi-account view of AWS Compute Optimizer recommendations. So Compute Optimizer was recently put out and it allows you to see recommendations for not just making an instance bigger or smaller, but it recommends particular instance family changes. So you can really optimize what you're doing with EC2 and not overpay for anything that you're doing. So again, now with this new view, I can get a view of all of my EC2 Compute Optimizer recommendations across all of my AWS accounts in a single place. So this makes it really easy for me to focus on optimizing how my compute is working in the cloud. Next, AWS Step Functions now support code build service integration. So this means that I can directly call code build from a step function. So step functions, if you haven't seen it, is essentially a, uh, a state machine workflow. So I can define different steps and conditions and uh, build out a process, and I can now call code build as part of that. This means I can use step functions to create uh, more complex build and release flows that might have conditional logic based in them. Uh, you could previously do this by writing a custom Lambda function, but now you can skip that and have a native integration from step functions to code build. All right, the last two for this month, the uh, Amazon EC2 M6G instances are now generally available. So these instances are based on the AWS Graviton 2 processor and they provide 40% better price performance over the non uh, over the non graviton processors that exist in AWS which means they're a really great way to get more bang for your buck when it comes to performance on EC2 now worth noting these ones aren't in the Sydney region yet they are in a lot of different AWS regions but what's really impressive about it is that the graviton processor has been something that AWS has been working on to to really optimize what we can do with compute in the cloud and seeing the the graviton 2s hit general availability is a really big milestone and the last one I wanted to call out for this month is the CDK for Kubernetes so if you've not heard of the, the AWS CDK, uh, we had Hugh come and present for us a couple of months back about, uh, about the CDK, um, the Cloud Development Kit. Essentially what it is, is it allows you to create cloud formation templates, but you can use a familiar programming language like uh, you know, Node.js. We can use uh, C Sharp, Java, Python, and generate cloud formation. Now this solves a lot of different problems about how you wanna manage those JSON and YAML files. So now what's been released, and it's in a, in a preview state at the moment, is the CDK for Kubernetes. And so given that most Kubernetes apps are driven from these YAML files, which can get very large and very complicated, I can now take those same principles about the CDK that we use for cloud formation, but apply it to how I generate my Kubernetes applications. And the really great thing about this is it's completely open. Everything it generates is native Kubernetes YAML, right? So you're not gonna be tying yourself to running in any kind of AWS service this is just about running really great Kubernetes apps. So if you're in that space and, and developing there and sick of managing YAML files by hand, definitely one to go and check out. Now, classroom courses, again, typically I would have been talking about ones that are coming up in Canberra, but given that we're all virtual at the moment, uh, as evidenced by the fact that I'm still presenting to you from my house, um, the online training is what I wanna call out. So again, if you go to www.aws.training, you'll find a complete list of courses and times. You can filter it by virtual classroom live and then find a date and time that works for you. This is also really great to consider because there's a lot of courses that are available in this format that wouldn't previously have been able to run in Canberra. So it means that you can get access to more training courses and, and take them as a virtual classroom so that you can really find the learning that's relevant for you. Now, in terms of white papers this month, uh, the teams producing these have been super busy. I've got two slides worth of updates here, and I'm not going to talk through them all. There are a couple that I wanted to call out for you, though. Uh, first of all, we've got an update to the Microsoft SQL Server best practices uh, document for AWS. So again, this is based on those changes that have been released this month. 
so again, really good to see that we keep these white papers up to date based on the feature changes we make in the platform. The other one on this slide that I wanted to call out was the one that's at the bottom of the list. It's a new white paper around guidelines for implementing AWS WAF. So this is our web application firewall. And again, customers had been asking us for specific guidance on how to get the most out of a WAF configuration. This new white paper shares some of those best practices. Onto the second page, again, I'm not gonna go through them all, but I wanted to call out a couple here as well. There are two updates for the AWS well-architected framework around the different lenses. So the well-architected framework, if you've not heard of it, is uh, a set of questions that you can ask yourself about how you're running your workloads in the cloud. And when you start looking through your answers, oh, there goes my mouse. When you start looking through your answers, you can start looking at uh, you know, recommendations to mitigate particular risks that you might find. Now, one size doesn't necessarily fit every workload. So we started creating these lenses to focus on particular types of workloads. And so this month, we've seen a financial services industry lens and an analytics workloads lens. So if either of those are interesting to, to you or your customers or people that you're working with, you've now got these very specific sets of questions to help you build better applications in the cloud. So before we, uh, we wrap up and I get ready to hand over to Craig, uh, as always, what do you wanna hear? Yeah, you know, reach back out through Meetup. Let us know if there's particular topics you're interested in or things you want to know. Um, very, very keen to hear from you. If you're interested in presenting for us, uh, even if it's just a quick five minutes of, hey, I learned something cool and I wanted to tell people about it, um, I would love to hear from you. The, uh, the whole concept of the user group here is that I don't want to make it the AWS show every month. So uh, being able to hear from everyone out there is something that I'm really, really interested in. Also, please make sure you submit your feedback every month. If you RSVP'd through Meetup, you'll get a, an email notification or an, an app notification tomorrow saying, hey, let us know what you thought. Uh, we do look at it every month. Um, I did see the, the remarks that went in last month after the technical issues. So yeah, I'm definitely reading it. But um, but please, we, we do take the feedback very seriously and I use it to help make sure we bring you the content that you really wanna see. And lastly, friends don't let friends miss the AWS user group. Word of mouth really is our best mechanism for letting people know about what we're doing, and especially now that we're virtual and people can connect from anywhere. So share it on your show, share it on your social networks, tell your friends, email it around, send it via carrier pigeon if that's what works for you. Um, but let everybody know that the AWS user group is online and still happening. So this is the point now where we're going to hand over to Craig to uh, to kick off the main presentation for the evening. Craig, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Brian? That I can. And hopefully see my screen as well. Uh, yes, as I frantically click some buttons. Excellent. So, uh, Craig, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, and lead off into the main presentation for us? Thanks, Brian. And can I say it's really good to see that white paper on financial regulations in Argentina has been updated. I've been I, hanging for that one. I knew you were waiting <laughs> for it, buddy. <laughs> uh, so, thanks, uh to Brian for inviting me along tonight. I wish I was there in Canberra because it really is uh, always great to visit our nation's capital, but have to wait a few more months, I think. Um, I'm a, an IoT specialist architect. I've been working at Amazon for five years. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about IoT and software, because when we think of IoT, we think of connected devices and we think of um, hardware. But uh, increasingly, software is uh, very important in this space and will, in, in, will continue to be very important in this space. So when we look at IoT, we ask the question, if you knew the state of everything and could reason on top of that data, what problems would you solve? Um, and increasingly, when I speak to customers, we have this um, to or fro on this uh, between uh, the data and IoT. So uh, very often a colleague of mine will go in and he will uh, talk about data lakes and analytics and how you can make insights in your data. And then they'll go, what about all those other things out there that are connected in my world? How can I get access to that data? And other times I'll go in there and I'll tell them about IoT sensors and networks and those type of things. And then um, I will uh, that would lead to a question about, oh, okay, once I get all that data into the cloud, how can I get insights into it? So data is very important when we're talking about IoT. 
It's worth thinking about the benefits of the cloud because one of the things that uh, our customers tell us they love is that the customer allows them to respond quickly to their circumstances. Uh, we need to respond very quickly at the moment to change circumstances uh, due to COVID-19, for example. But you know, you would need, need to be able to respond quickly to changes in market, changes in your customer requirements, and also at the same time, optimize your costs, maintain security, and um, minimize or at least manage complexity. And these benefits of cloud, we really want to extend them to IoT. So how do we do that? And when we look at our IoT services, we uh, categorize them into three categories. We uh, have device software, which is the topic of today, our connectivity and control services, which are uh, for ingesting data um, from tens to thousands to millions of devices, and then routing that data through to other services. You could route them to our IoT analytics services where you can start to do asset modeling and build SaaS solutions, um, and also uh, do analytics and feed insights into things like QuickSight. Now, we look at the IoT uh, software um, services that are available just quickly to go through them. If we start with the connectivity and control services at the bottom left, IoT Core is our foundational service, which was launched in 2015 now, which is uh, each AWS account gets an ingestion point that you can send the data to and all devices are uniquely identified um, and then given privileges to, to send the data through to what is essentially a pub sub broker. You can then uh, create rules which route the data, data to back-end services like S3 and DynamoDB and those ones we know and love, or to analytics services uh, like IoT analytics, events, and things graph. Just uh, before I get too far away from connectivity and control services, device management and device defender are very important uh, for managing deployments of thousands and millions of devices and also securing it. Uh, it's important that we can automate security so we can respond to, say, a compromised device and, and block it from a network. Today, we're really going to focus on the software side of things. So we're looking at the device software down here, and this is where we're starting is with the software that gets installed onto the devices themselves. How can I build devices at the edge that work with AWS IoT? So first of all, we, we like to think of devices at the edge uh, as things, uh, connected devices. And we've got at the top left there, we've got smart locks, smart lights, coffee machines, and they're typically powered by microcontrollers, very low powered devices. Down the bottom left, we've got things that are a little bit more powered. They have a CPU and they have a camera, a smart camera, for example, or a control hub in a, a, a haul truck at a mine site, for example. And then we have hubs and gateways, which act uh, like local hubs, which can aggregate data from the edge and then send that to the cloud. And if we look at the software that uh, plays a part in those spaces, for the microcontroller devices, we have FreeRTOS, which is um, a leading microcontroller operating system. It's a real-time operating system uh, that uh, has about 20 to 30% market share. And you can install that on these low-power devices. Uh, we support a really large range of chipsets that do that. Uh, for the hubs and gateways, and also for, for devices with um, CPUs, you can install Greengrass, which is our edge software, and then deploy functionality on top of that runtime to, to perform local actions. You also have the option to use the SDK, which is available uh, for embedded C in a, a range of operating systems and languages so that you can um, make use on general purpose CPU devices, whether it's just something you're hacking up on your laptop or building on a Raspberry Pi, you can use that as well. And when we think about free RTOS, it comes with some great features around being able to um, natively connect to AWS IoT so that you can route data to the cloud using MQTT, which is a TCP-based protocol, very lightweight. Uh, it also comes with an, uh, an over-the-air update agent so that you can deploy software updates uh, automatically to keep your devices secure. If we go uh, to IoT Greengrass, IoT Greengrass is software that uh, will run on pretty much any CPU. You deploy the Greengrass core, which is effectively a runtime, and then you can deploy functionality on top of that. And IoT Greengrass, the underlying runtime or IoT Greengrass core has its own over-the-air update as well, so that you can keep it nice and secure. And then lastly, AWS IoT Device Tester, because there are thousands and thousands of devices out there, how do you know that your tester, uh, your tester, your device is actually going to work with these services? You can use IoT Device Tester, which is a test automation tool, which allows you 
to uh, very quickly check that your device will work with our services. Now, that might sound not that exciting, I suppose. It's just some testing software, but we've found that projects typically get stalled where people are trying to um, update uh, or do device selection, for example, and it can take a while. So being able to speed up that part of the process really makes a difference. And iTunes popped up. I don't know why iTunes popped up. There you go. <laughs> now, once you've gone through and tested your software, you can then um, submit it for listing on our device portal. And so once it's submitted, it'll appear in our AWS device catalog. If you go to devices.amazonaws.com, you can see which devices have been through this process and been filtered, and you can select them very quickly. So if you don't have your own device, and you don't want to test your own device, but uh, you just want to get one that's been used before, that's a great way of getting to that. And there's, there's literally hundreds of devices, cameras, gateways uh, that are available there. Now, Greengrass is uh, edge software, but it can run on anything with a CPU. And it's important to understand that Greengrass is software, so it'll run on pretty much anything with a CPU, and there are different versions for different binaries. But once you've installed Greengrass, you can register it with your AWS IoT account, and then you can deploy functionality from the cloud down to the edge. And that's great if you want to run low latency applications, you want to process data at the edge so you don't have to send it all to the cloud, which could be quite expensive, or you have privacy or compliance concerns as well. And some of the use cases we see, you might say, how is this used? Well, people are using it to do local action. So this is where you want to take control. You want to send some code to the edge to make a local decision. And you don't want it to depend on a, an internet connection. Greengrass needs to be connected to the internet for deployment and updates. But then after that, it uh, will keep running disconnected, which is an important part of its design. Another emerging area that Greengrass is being used for is around machine learning inference. And this is where people are building and training machine learning um, models in the cloud. And after they've trained the model, they're taking, sending that trained model to the edge to do inference. And uh, computer vision and predictive maintenance are, are two common use cases in that realm. And then the other uh, reason that people are doing at the edge is they're trying to extract data, often from uh, devices that might be legacy and use uh, um, odd uh, industrial protocols that aren't that common in the cloud. And you might want to then do that protocol conversion and then do some aggregation and, and then send that data through to the cloud. And Greengrass has these foundational components. It effectively allows you to create an isolated uh, local IoT environment with Greengrass acting like the hub for all the messages from your devices at the edge. And you can take local actions. You can see the Lambda sign there. So it's Lambda code you've written in the cloud and deployed to the edge. And you can also do a whole range of other IoT use cases at the edge. I wanted to focus on a couple of the enhanced capabilities today because it's not a green grass talk and uh, it's really focusing on the software. But uh, when we're talking about machine learning uh, inference, what it allows you to do is to train models uh, in SageMaker, which is uh, our um, machine learning service to put uh, machine learning into the hands of all developers. Once you've trained that model, you can then add it to a Greengrass group and do a deployment, and then it'll deploy it to run down at the edge. You can also use SageMaker Neo, which can reduce the, the size of the, the runtime for the model so that it can run on constrained devices. And the reach of ML is really growing. And if you look around at these use cases, you see that a lot of them happen in the IoT or the, the, the physical world. You've got automotive, you've got oil and gas, you've got manufacturing, robotics, uh, retail. Uh, even healthcare, all have physical components. So if we can train these machine learning models and have them run locally, there's a lot of value to be had. And it really is a flywheel as well, because you can collect data from the edge or on-premises, and then you can train in the cloud, you can do your inference at the edge, but then you can collect um, after you've inferred and taken action at the edge, you can then get new data from the edge to improve your model. It becomes a virtuous cycle to improve machine learning models. And here's an example architecture I wanted to share with you. This is a computer vision use case. So this is where somebody has built and trained maybe an image classification or an object detection model in the cloud. Uh, you can see SageMaker there. So I'll test out my new pointy tool. There you go, SageMaker. And then I'll see if I can get the, there we go, SageMaker. And then you've trained the model. You've deployed that out to Greengrass. That's copied the model down to the edge. You've got a local Lambda function which is 
um, executing that model on a, a maybe a, a timer. But in this case, what it's doing is it's <laughs> I've I've um, jumped the shark with my new pointer tool. So the way this works is you have an IoT topic that will send a message down to Greengrass and it'll execute the Lambda function. When the message comes through, it'll run the Lambda function and do the computer vision inference at the edge. And then it'll just send back to the cloud the, the JSON uh, payload saying what was extracted from the image. And as you can see, the Lambda functions can also upload samples to a data lake. And you can do that so that you can improve the model over time. Another thing that's been added to Greengrass reasonably recently is this uh, container support. So you can now take Docker containers that have been uh, created anywhere and deploy them to run on edge devices. So if you had a Raspberry Pi and you wanted to install Greengrass and then you had it registered with your cloud account, you could send uh, containers to, to run down on that device. And so you might have an existing application. Uh, you can then put it into a container image and then you can deploy it out to, to green grass. And we support uh, the ability to pull images from multiple sources to green grass. You can pull it from the uh, Amazon ECR, from Docker Hub, or from your own private repository as well. So there's multiple options there. And a company that's using that is AdLink. AdLink, you'll see them on our device gateway. They uh, use green grass and um, the ability to deploy containers to manage their um, edge um, devices and I've got uh, some partners like uh, Big Mate which are using AdLink very successfully. So this is some of the software that we're seeing but there is a, a, a continuum here of devices that uh, fall outside of our IoT services which are, are worth pointing out because this is talking to how we're providing the ability for you to deploy software to where it's needed. So if you have a look at this uh, diagram I've got here on the far right you can see what you typically understand as the AWS cloud. It's uh, three availability zones. It uh, shows a local zone there, which is a new construct that uh, we launched in Los Angeles last year. But as we move to the left and we can see the braced area, we can see a range of other services. So if you uh, look at outposts, that's where we provide hardware um, that we use in our data centers to allow you to deploy generalized workloads to your environment. We will ship these uh, racks of our gear to your data center, and then you can manage them from the cloud. Uh, Wavelength is, is gonna put general purpose compute into the edge of 5G networks, and it's being trialed in the US at the moment. If we move across, then we've got Snowball Edge, uh, Robomaker, Greengrass, and Freeartos. And if you look at the, the, the one consistency across it is that we're providing the ability for you to deploy code, to, to deploy functionality, to where it is needed using a common programming model and a common set of tools. Very important for software development. If you remember when we were talking about the benefits of cloud, a lot of it is about the speed to innovation. Now we look at Snowball Edge quickly because it's a, it's a really interesting um, product line and it's got some exciting things coming as well. Snowball uh, family was originally um, brought to market to allow people to move terabytes of data to the cloud. So you created a job in the console or from the CLI, a Snowball device would be shipped to your facility, you'd connect it to the network, copy your data to the device and then uh, send it back to the cloud, uh, back to our data centers and we'd put it into an S3 bucket. Uh, Snowball and Snowball Edge now have compute on them as well. So you can actually uh, take uh, Amazon machine images that you've created in the cloud and have your Snowball Edge arrive with um, the, the uh, compute image installed on it. That then allows you to do things like install Greengrass into an AMI and have that arrive in your environment. So if you, this is one of the use cases you had here, whether it was in a mine site or on a ship at sea or on a wind farm, and you wanted to do compute to process a lot of data at the edge, when you have very poor network connectivity, you could use uh, Snowball Edge to do that. And a good example of how this is all being pulled together is in the, the factory of the future, as we're calling it. And we've got a multi-year collaboration with Volkswagen to build their industrial cloud. And what they're starting with is they're starting with their digital production platform. And this is where they're using all those elements of the, um, the device to edge to cloud spectrum to build this digital production platform to provide a consistent analytics layer across all of their uh, facilities. 
And uh, ultimately, they want to extend that capability and create what's called the Volkswagen Industrial Cloud and on-sell that as a capability. Uh, this will uh, then allow the you know, uh, manufacturer to be a lot more efficient, to manage supply chains a lot quicker, uh, and innovate a lot quicker for their customers. And we have a quick look at a manufacturing reference architecture just to show how the components I previously showed will um, stick together. You've got your production on the left there, the production site, which is the physical plant, and then you've got your operations and the operational components there in the green box. And if we switch to the reference architecture and the eye chart, if we start at the left, you can see all those factory machines which are running protocols like Modbus and OPC UA. They're integrating with our edge services like Greengrass and Sitewise Collector, which runs on top of Greengrass. You can use Snowball Edge to ingest data. You can use Outposts. So this is where our um, racks are running on site at the plant. And uh, they might be running something like Storage Gateway that allows you then to, to get that data into the cloud. And then on the left, you've got a whole range of uh, services uh, range uh, to uh, about routing the data to a data lake uh, and then looking for insights in them using services like Glue, Athena, QuickSight or whatever analytics tool you prefer to use. It just gives you an idea of uh, how all the bits and pieces would fit together for a manufacturing use case. And so that's all very well and good. And it's showing all those bits and pieces. Um, you understand where they fit into the device to edge spectrum. And having those underlying uh, core bits of enablement, whether it's the SDK or Greengrass or Snowball or Outposts, and having that consistent plane of operation where you can use a programming model, you can use your APIs and your SDKs and your tools that you're used to using in the cloud to deploy to those edge and device environments then allows you to iterate uh, very quickly on building new solutions to the edge. If we have a look at this, uh, the virtual cycle, I've, I've got cloud formation up there because when we build environments in the cloud, we like to use something like cloud formation to create our environment. And if we look at the IoT services which are supported in um, cloud formation, IoT analytics, so I was not yet still in preview, so we'll cut them a break on that one. IoT events, IoT things graph, IoT core, and then over here, Greengrass is also um, provided. Now, if you think about it, FreeRTOS, the SDK, Greengrass and Device Tester are all software you download and you run on a device. So the when we're talking about cloud formation for Greengrass, I'm talking about the ability to use cloud formation to define the resources that sit on top of Greengrass. So the resources might include the machine learning models, the uh, Lambda code, the IoT rules around routing the edge. They can be described in cloud formation and then deployed down to the edge. So this then allows you to, to if you think about it as our IoT and edge solutions evolve over the next few years, you'll end up being able to use the level of automation for software deployment in the cloud through to the edge. And a good architecture to look at this is the smart product solution architecture, which is available as a solution that you can deploy in your account um, and um, experiment with right now. And if we look at this, you can see that uh, it's modeling HVAC, so um, uh, air conditioning, heating devices, coming through to IoT core. And then there's a range of, if you like, uh, sub-architectures here to perform different uh, elements of the stack. Now, when you deploy this in your um, account, you actually get the choice of choosing which bits and pieces you want to deploy. You don't need to deploy the whole stack, so it's very flexible. So think about if you're registering a new device. This is showing the workflow for that. So you've got devices coming through uh, that are going to hit the IoT core service in the cloud. That will route the uh, messages to a Lambda function. Uh, Lambda function is, of course, event-driven. Uh, that registration will then register the data in the DynamoDB. And then if we go right through to the right side there, you can see the device users up the top right. They're accessing an app that is using AWS Amplify. And Amplify is integrating with API Gateway, uh, which is using Lambda to access the same data. So you can start to see how you can build software applications all the way through from device to the uh, UI. If we have a little 
deep dive onto the just-in-time registration workflow. The way it works is that uh, when you register a device, it creates what's called an IoT policy that then gets attached to a certificate and then the certificate gets attached to a, a thing and that allows the thing to securely access the cloud and um, uh, send data through. And we just launched a new feature with AWS IoT Core to make this even easier. So if you're going to manufacture devices, you now have the ability to define templates for onboarding so that uh, you can um, effectively have your devices ship with no credentials. And then the first time they connect, your application can securely um, authorize those devices and provide them with the credentials, unique credentials, for them to access the service. This solves the problem of device manufacturers having to, to create unique identities for their devices at manufacturer for fulfillment. That can be done at fulfillment or when they're first connected. And the way this works is it, um, the uh, customer device has a bootstrap certificate, which is a sh like a shared secret, uh, that enacts a birth policy the, um, in the, the cloud the um, uh, payload gets sent back and then there's a challenge where the device sends through a provisioning template with some information uh, that gets executed on the back end and it responds with the, the details of the provisioning and then the device can substitute its bootstrap certificate if it's successful for its generated certificate and then start uh, accessing the environment. Another part of the smart product solution is about just dealing with messages. So you've got a HVAC device that's sending through messages. You can see here the message comes through to the core service. Uh, the IoT core service has a rule that's routing those messages to another Lambda function. Uh, those messages are stored in DynamoDB um, and they can also be sent to another Lambda and then a notification sent through depending on what the messages are. Um, and then you can also, as you can see, you can the device users from the right there are able to access the app or the UI or web console in this case. Uh, that is querying the same database using Amplify, API Gateway, etc. You can see this in uh, the workflow here. The device message is coming through. The rule is sending it through to different DynamoDB tables and can also send through uh, an SMS. And you also have the option, if there's a, a heavy workload that has to send large amounts of data, you could use SQS or Kinesis. Uh, now, Telemetry uh, analytics, this is uh, very important for IoT solutions. So this is where you want to see, you know, the volume of messages coming through. It's really helpful for understanding the, the uh, how well your environment is, is running. Um, so if you see a, a change in what uh, um, your message pattern, it can indicate, uh, say, a network issue or a problem downstream. And the way this works is that devices are sending through messages to the, the cloud. There's a rule uh, in the IoT core service that is taking all that telemetry data and it's sending into the IoT analytics service. Analytics has these functions of channel, pipeline, data store and data set, um, which is really uh, for another topic, um, another session perhaps. Telemetry Lambda function is working on the, the pipeline there and you can enrich the data. And the good thing about IoT analytics is once you've processed the data in there, it's accessible from SageMaker and also from QuickSight. So you can very quickly start to build charts using QuickSight on IoT data. And then secondly, you can start to very quickly use SageMaker to start building, say, predictive maintenance um, models uh, without having to deploy that much in the way of cloud infrastructure. And then the final workflow here is to show how you can send commands out to a device. So you've got your users, we'll start on the right this time. They've accessed their application, uh, they've authenticated with Cognito. They can then send uh, the uh, command into the DynamoDB table. Uh, that command can also be sent from that Lambda function in the bottom right directly to the IT core service as a message. The devices themselves can be subscribing to the MQTT topics that that message is on and then they can take action. And so you can see that the, the flow there around some of the, um, the, the different workflows. So you can see that um, the device, uh, the, sorry, the user on the far right is executing a command. The command service Lambda function has published a command to the device gateway. That has then sent the, the message out to the device. You can also see that um, the, uh, on the bottom flow there that you can have uh, messages come through uh, from devices and then have them stored in the command table as well. 
And lastly, uh, but very importantly, uh, is around security in this architecture. So you can route all your messages to AWS IoT Device Defender. One of the things that we coach to people in the cloud is that uh, automation is really key to your security response these days. You need to be able to automate responses because the attackers in the cloud um, will uh, start and end an attack very quickly and so you can't really rest on manual interventions. And it's true with IoT use cases as well. There was a famous uh, IoT uh, DDoS attack, I think it was the Mirai malware virus, where a bunch of webcams and baby monitors were compromised a few years ago. And they had a, uh, because there was a, I think a shared password, and they uh, had a coordinated attack on a large part of the world's DNS infrastructure and took down a, a big slab of the internet. So the core service uh, here will send the messages through to Device Defender. And you can have rules in Device Defender that are looking for anomalies in configuration and anomalies in traffic patterns. And it can uh, alert or mitigate or take action on those devices because uh, Device Defender integrates very well with the device management service that allows you to do things like disconnect a device, uh, reboot a device, or, or to do some kind of other action. Device management's not shown on the here as well. It's uh, device management, device defender are really, uh, they um, sort of show up under the IoT core service. Device management allows you to do uh, actions across uh, large fleets of uh, devices. So you can do bulk registrations, you can do indexing of devices by attributes and group types. You can do dynamic queries and then take action on dynamic queries. And you can also send jobs out to devices. So if you wanted to do an over-the-air update of software on a device and it wasn't um, um, a, or change configuration, you can uh, issue a job from the IoT device management service. Uh, it's important to understand that the core service, the device defender and device management service all work really well together to allow that level of automation. Now, the, the secret uh, thing I really love about the smart product solution I saved to, to the end, that if you deploy this solution, it's actually deployed with its own CRCD pipeline. So this is now where you're starting to see CRCD pipelines applied to IoT use cases. So if you uh, deploy the, um, the the solution from the website, and I've got the the link at the edge, you at the end, you'll <laughs> you'll see that uh, it'll create a code commit repository, and it'll store in there the code around um, first of all doing some unit tests on the CDK um, manifest and um, software that comes with it. And then it creates the, um, it does the CDK deploy to create the CloudFormation uh, artifacts, which are then used to build the environment. And in this way, you're building an IoT solution that uh, can be changed and managed in uh, the similar manner to CRCD pipelines. So as we see with the different components of our device to edge to cloud spectrum of things like free RTOS, IoT Greengrass, Snowball Edge, Outposts, all the way through to the cloud. As you see that underlying platform consistency and how it can be applied to program models, it'll allow you to use the same development methods that you're used to using in cloud only solutions to deploy IoT solutions. So this is very exciting because it'll allow you to uh, iterate on IoT solutions a lot quicker and deliver new features and new constructs. Added to this, and I don't have a slide to, to talk about this, um, but uh, we're increasingly seeing IoT solutions deployed in the AWS marketplace. So not only can you buy code functionality in the AWS marketplaces, you can buy uh, solutions that IoT vendors have put into the, the marketplace and that uh, the delivery and fulfillment of the actual physical devices is managed as part of the AWS marketplace workflow. But then the software can be managed consistently um, through for, for those providers. So those partners that are building these IoT solutions and getting in the marketplace have a large, um, well, they, they have a very frictionless way of getting their solutions to market and a global marketplace. So it's exciting times for IoT uh, businesses. And so some of the summaries of the best practices here is uh, serverless architecture. We haven't seen an EC2 instance in any of this. So it allows you to build with these constructs that allows you to start with an architecture 
and just have it scale. One of the great things about our IoT services is you just pay for what you use. There's no pre-provisioning required of, um, you know, or guessing how much you're going to use. So you can deploy that uh, and as it evolves or as it scales, we manage the scaling for you. Uh, device registration is key. So this is how you get a device that has um, uh, been delivered, uh, been arrived on a, 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 at its location. How do you uh, make sure that it has its unique credentials so that it can be secured individually to the cloud? Um, and then thinking about how you uh, analyze the data. So how you can use not just the IoT analytics services, but many of our customers find that they love to use you know, just S3, uh, Athena, Glue, uh, everything through to Aurora and um, um, if they're, they're preferred tools, whether it's uh, QuickSight, Power BI, Tableau, for example. And then importantly, across the, the realm here, as you're using serverless architecture, there's, um, there's uh, the services that we manage and secure up to the level of configuration for you. Uh, it's important to understand and manage your security. And recently, um, uh, as part of our IRAP uplift to protected, our IoT core service was actually um, ratified for protected workloads in Sydney as well. So as we run through to the end here, if you'd like to have a look at that solution, deploy it uh, and have a look at how the constructs work and how CDK and CloudFormation work to deploy a solution for IoT, uh, have a look at that solution there. Also, uh, just recapping on what Brian said, is that the uh, training website is really great. And there's a bunch of free IoT training up there. Just go to their site, search for IoT, um, and a lot of it will get you started really quickly if you want to write up a Python script or something like that and have it integrate with um, the, the cloud and see how the, the, the IoT services work. So thank you for listening today. I hope it has been glitch-free, apart from my iTunes inexplicably popping up. Um, <laughs> but it's been a pleasure to talk to my laptop and to all of you up there in Canberra, and I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, very soon. Excellent. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, it's yeah, Hopefully that was a, an interesting session for everyone this evening. Um, again, the recording here will be on Twitch for anyone who wants to come back and, and look at it later, or you can share the links around with your friends. Uh, again, word of mouth is our, our best thing ever. Um, and remember, submit your feedback through Meetup. So, uh, you know, again, getting those reminders out there. Um, we'll be back again next month. Um, we've got uh, what I believe will be a customer presentation lined up next month. So we'll uh, we'll send the details out on that one through Meetup as soon as it's available. And uh, if anyone's got any other questions for Craig, uh, we'll just drop them in the chat room. We'll keep an eye on the chat room for the next little bit. But, uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for coming and spending your evening with us, everyone. Thank you, Craig, for presenting. And uh, we will see you all again next month, everyone. Thank you.